Hello there. Uh, I'm Kane Sims, and I run the VUX World podcast. Anyone heard the VUX World podcast? Yeah, put myself on a spot a little bit here. Do check it out if you are interested in uh, learning all about voice design, strategy, and development. And I will allow the panel to introduce themselves. We have some of the top designers and strategists in the industry, let alone in the country, on the stage right now. So we'll start with Ben on my left. Do you want to tell us who you are, Ben, and maybe an example of some of the things that you've been working on in the voice space? Yeah, sure. So uh, my name is Ben Sauer. I'm a product director at Babylon Health. Um, last year, I was training people in voice for O'Reilly, uh, and I've trained people in voice design all over the world, including NASA. I can die happy now. Um, so uh, at Babylon, we've been iterating over like literally dozens of voice uh, use cases. So we've learned a lot in that time. Haven't launched anything yet, but uh, watch this space. Cool. Charlie? Uh, hi, I'm Charlie Cabri. I'm the CEO of Say It Now. I've been working in voice since 2015, where we proved that you could book an airline ticket using your voice, then um, built out a, uh, an in-room assistant uh, with Marriott, so you could uh, order a gin and tonic uh, in your bedroom using your voice, um, before moving that into UK Rail. And then we set up Say It Now 18 months ago to bring our kind of relatively mature understanding about how to launch voice products uh, to the masses. And our, uh, our kind of peak um, moment was this summer winning the uh, Alexa Cup. We won the UK round, the European round, and then we came runners up in Newark. We got beaten by Barbie. <laughs> it's a scandal. It's a scandal. It's a scandal. That deserves a round of applause, doesn't it? <laughs> <laughs> Surely. <laughs> Jen? Uh, hi, everyone. I'm Jen Heap. I'm the uh, CCO and co founder of Vixen Labs. Uh, Vixen Labs is a. Oh, my mic just suddenly got louder. Hello, everyone. Um, is a um, voice consultancy and product design studio based here in London. Uh, we work with uh, major brands all around the world uh, to help define the strategy for voice and what is going to be applicable for them. And then when uh, it is pertinent, also we build voice entities for them. So entities in the broadest sense. Fantastic. Great. I think you guys already know me. <laughs> hey, you've just been here. Move on, Rosie. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Rosie Meredith, so I head up the uh, strategy offering at Foxy Digital. We are a voice development agency as well. We're based in London, um, have been for the last couple of years, and we build uh, voice experiences primarily on Google Assistant and Alexa for major kind of household brands. So we've done, in the last couple of years, of over 40 um, big skills for brands such as Unilever and uh, Diageo. We do a lot of um, entertainment skills as well for kind of major film production companies. And um, I'm also co-founder of Semi Sample, which, is, which was the world's first voice activated sampling platform, which is this really annoying buzzword way of saying uh, we built a voice platform basically that allows um, brands to activate their existing creative with a call to action of ask Alexa, uh, Alexa, send me a sample of Diet Coke, and then it magically appears at your door. Fantastic. So we'll maybe get into some of the detail around sort of designing for voice. Uh, but first, I want to go back over to this side with you, Ben. Uh, one of the things that when we first met, you said that has stuck with me ever since, I mm. think it's pertinent to set in the scene for this discussion is, yep. you mentioned that things break down into two parts. One is designing the right thing, and the next is designing the thing right. So yeah. when it comes to voice, why is it so important to first of all design the right thing? And what do you mean by that? Oh, um, it's a big old question. Um, so, Katerina Fake, co-founder of Flickr, to say this another way, she said, um, it's probably more important to work on the right thing than it is to work hard. I'm paraphrasing badly, right? So, um, I, I think there's a truth in that, right? Which is that you have to think very hard if you're going to make success of voice, that your use case is right. Um, but what I would say is that we're in, a, we're in a, a period where I'm not sure that we should be placing that high an expectation on the things that we produce in our organization, because we're in a learning phase, both for the consumers and organizations. That's probably what we need to be doing. Is mostly what we've been doing at Babylon is exploring which use cases work, because we're asking people to engage in behaviors that are very new and to shift their behaviors away from 
things that they are tra traditionally very attached to, like how do I book a GP, for example, right? That's something that you think you have a mental model of, and now we're, we're shifting that. That's a highly sensitive situation. So design the right thing, you know, think hard about which use cases are actually going to work, but forgive yourself if they don't, because no one's getting it really right yet. And then design the thing right. Get deeply into the practice of how to design for voice, because there is a rich history there. It's very niche. There's only a small group of designers, mostly people who worked at Nuance, for example, um, who, know, who now all run Google Assistant and Alexa. Um, but there is a rich history there to tap into. You just have to look hard to find it and, and figure out what the practices are. I think the main problem we have today is that there's no metaphor for how to design for voice, right? So when we design on screen, we don't need a metaphor. We're just like moving the boxes around and we're designing something that people can see. But when we go to design flows or what uh, Amazon are up to at the moment, it's changing the way that we design because we're applying a tree metaphor, for example, um, or a flow metaphor. But those aren't actually conversations. You know that saying, um, uh, all models are broken, but some are useful. And that's the phase we're in with voice at the moment. Sorry, I was pulling along with No, no, is, is there, Jen, is there any other way to design other than that tree-based way of going about things? A or B, down the tree, so to speak? Um, yeah, yes. I mean, the short version is yes, the most definitely is. Um, I think um, the pain points that we have is there is no standardized way of navigating, to touch on your point, there's no standardized way of navigating through a voice experience. So the reality of quite often needing to come into the beginning of a skill, as in you just open it up, you know, you come to like the landing page of the website, is you most often do need to set out the stall of what is involved in there. And the majority of the time, the clearest way of doing that is to offer a menu that gives a top level that then feeds down into a decision tree. Um, going into something that is sort of get, getting, getting too funky and breaking too many of the rules and we don't even have rules is a danger, but I would say it is really dependent on the use case. So, for example, being if your use case is that you're creating a skill, but within it there are very specific and almost siloed tasks that that skill is going to do that can be accessed through um, an explicit invocation, a direct invocation, uh, basically like a deep link, um, and you can go in and, and do that, and you can do that safely. By I mean safely, as you can have issues by the synonyms that you use to pick that up. I'll give an example because I know I realise I'm being quite vague. Then you can have a way of being able to jump into functionality deep within a skill rather than having a waterfall <coughs> structure but you do need to create something that has a fundamental backbone and something that is relatively normative to what we're experiencing at the moment. And that is for a skill that would exist on, say, the skill store. Other voice experiences in car, on mobile, as in through like a voice augmentation of a mobile app or something like that may well be different. Mm -hmm. The semi assembly one's an interesting one mm. because it doesn't necessarily have a huge conversational tree. Is most of the design in that about getting short bursts of it right? And what's the difference between something like that that's intended to be like a dip in and out? Yeah, versus something that's a bit yeah more absolutely. It's a real kind of like call and response activation channel. So, I mean, we've done a kind of range at Voxy. We've done a lot of those sort of entertainment, much more sort of richer audio experience type skills. Um, and we're looking at more kind of situational design, so intentional, so kind of like module based. You know, free. We've done quite a lot with um, charities, which are sort of free text-based. You know, free search. But with Semi Sample, it was very much about making that journey and that user journey as seamless as possible and as friction-free. It literally is: see the advert, ask your assistant, turns up at your door. Mm -hmm. You know, because and and the benefits of brands was about you know data opt-in. It was about more targeted. So being out if your media strategy was targeted correctly, you know, you're a world away from just you know a brand saying you need to hand out these products at Waterloo Station to people with beards, and then actually they all go to like 13-year-old girls because the brand ambassadors just want to get them out. You know, that kind of ROI is, is much more stretched, and that value is hard to prove, whereas when it's much more data targeted, you know, response channel for voice, that analytics is really rich, and you can guarantee that that targeting is much better. But absolutely, from a voice design perspective, we didn't want to complicate it too much. And, you know, we're looking at it and we're iterating, and there are kind of areas where you might be able to optimize and put sort of richer brand content 
maybe some information in, all that sort of stuff. Um, but right now, it's kind of phase one, proving the use case, and it's definitely proven that it's worked, so yeah. May I add something yeah. onto that? Because I'm, I'm just thinking. <laughs> um, I realize that we're really talking about the top layer of design, but I really see the power in the language models that are behind yeah. uh, all these conversations. And uh, I, I see a future where you might not need a designer, that you can really rely on these strong language uh, models that pick up uh, these utterances and relate them directly to the answer you're looking for. Mm -hmm. and. Well, that's what's going on in our current world. There are many research groups from different companies, not only mine, <laughs> um, that are working on understanding natural language. And once we get that right, let's say, then we can actually leverage it to the fullest, this conversational piece we're talking about. Just to add on to what you're saying, we're really not there yet. We're, we're designing across where uh, our well, our language models aren't at the right state yet. Yeah, and that, I think that that's just so bang on, and I think that's why very often when you know, like my hesitation of like, well, yeah, you could essentially there are a million different ways that you could yeah. design, and what we would there's a, to what is working well now, and what would be a stable product, and what I would like to design yeah. are not the same things, and even what I think yeah. might give the best result from a user-centric design and UX best practices, those two things are not necessarily the same. Mm -hmm. And a huge amount of it is exactly because of that. It's because of the language modeling. It's because of the capabilities to pick yeah. up on the synonyms that you're going to be creating around those, um, those search queries within content and things like that. And it's because that is not stable, as I call it, and because you know it's going to fall flat on its face, and you're going to just be in a horrible feedback loop of error handling, that you do have to over-engineer yeah. the design, yeah. which is a real shame. And that's what we're doing. We're, we're over-engineering, actually, what our language models can process yeah, at this time. Yeah. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Charlie, you, you started out in the voice sort of space working with the sort of like travel sector and you've done some stuff in retail and stuff. So you've kind of been with this technology for, for quite a while. Is that the core challenge at the moment, from a, either from a design perspective or from a, from a finding success perspective? Is it, is it a technology challenge or is it something else going on? Uh, well, so we, so we set everything up from an, an insights perspective. You know, this in, you know to, to echo your point, you know, we're very much in a learning phase. So you need to be able to set, your, set yourself up with the expectation that what you're going to do is going to build the, the solid foundation for what you do next. And if you set yourself up with that, with that kind of goal and then um, the users up, the, the, the users um, with a kind of a narrow domain that they can then talk to, then you'll understand about what people are going to then use your service for, and then you build specifically for, um, for those use cases first and make them more robust. What are some of the um, language model aside, or maybe, mm -hmm. maybe we can delve deeper into that, but what are some of the kind of key learnings that well, maybe we'll kind of go around, around one at a time, the key learnings from a design perspective that you've learned over the past uh, like two to three years? Well, I suppose it's sort of moving away from SMAS and looking more at those sort of um, rich, maybe sort of content-based skills. One of the things we found at Voxy and that I think everyone in the industry is finding at the moment is that major, major difference between using Alexa's voice and using human-based actual human interaction, human voices, building experience, which is, they are limited at the moment with the technology, but doing as much as we can within what we have to make those experiences kind of really rich, really personal. Because, you know, we're, we're all sort of taking these um, assistants into our homes, giving them this really important role in our lives. I mean, like, Google deals with all my lights in my home, and the internet's down, I have to sit in the dark. It's, you know, I mean, you just think, that was a couple of years ago, you'd never do that. So designing to, we can say, to reward that attention and that intimacy that users are giving us as voice designers and brands who have, have voices is really important. I mean, there was a Voicebot article just yesterday, mm -hmm. I think, which was saying 71% of people who use voice skills prefer a human voice, which isn't really a kind of big, amazing um, stat, but it's useful to have the data behind it, I think, in terms of that. So, yeah, designing really, really kind of audio-rich, audio-immersive skills, particularly in the kids' space, really works for us. Well, you can, I mean, what's the, the kind of key insight that you've learned um, over the years? Yeah, I think for, for me, uh, what we also discuss internally a lot is that we see conversation as this new UI layer, let's say it, and it's so crucial for companies and brands to own that layer as well and understand what conversations are happening around their brand. So picking up uh, what users are asking and what answers you actually as a brand can't fulfill, but 
what wacky other things are people asking about your brand or asking it to do. And once you get that insight and you can learn from that, you can just take your, your, your brand and your, yeah, your product to a next level. And I really see that as, as the basis of what we're doing here. Yeah. From what you're doing, Ben, you're, you're kind of in the realms of, of changing people's habits and, and getting people to interact not only with a, with, a, with a new technology, but to do something that is really important to them and really emotive to them. So is there any insights that you've learned from the experiment and that you've been doing mm -hmm. that may apply maybe to other people working in healthcare or may apply more generally? Um, I think there's a couple of things. Um, the thing that's really struck me working in health is what I call the paradox of voice. So because it's tapping into like circuits of the brain that are hundreds of thousands of years old as opposed to let's say 30, right? We've been interacting with each other in voice, with each other with voice for hundreds of thousands of years potentially and computers for 30 to 50. So that's why broken voice experiences are so disappointing to people because you have hundreds of thousands of years of evolution building up your expectation. How, how is this thing going to operate for me? And when it doesn't work, it's incredibly disappointing. More disappointing than a screen-based interaction. On the other hand, so it's very, what I'm trying to say is it's very easy to lose trust in voice, extremely easy. On the other hand, because it's tapping into ancient parts of the brain, it's also the place which has the highest potential for trust. Right, so if you can make that trustworthy experience, and it feels like a person that you're interacting with, that's absolutely gold. And we're not really there yet. These things aren't reliable enough for us to fulfill on that trust. What I would say about sort of tactical research at Babylon is that um, about one in five of the folks that we test with show an unusual degree of trust in their voice assistants. So they'll say things like, um, I, I have the Google Assistant next to my laptop all day and I ask it spelling questions. Or, I know Alexa's not real, but um, she's my friend at home. And so over time, we start to see these behaviours shift and higher, higher degrees of trust if we can overcome some of the reliability and the difficulty of the AI problems. You know, it's not, we're not able to have proper AI-driven conversations yet without scripting them. But once we hit those barriers and we're able to overcome them, then we're going to see some very fundamental shifts in expectation. So just to come back to what I was saying, slightly long-winded, highest potential for trust, easiest place to lose it. What do you think is in store then over the next 12 to 18 months? So, um, the, you know, for me, the biggest challenge is all around discoverability and retention. So um, the... There was a great quote from um, the BBC head of voice design. She, was, she said that um, we're in the crap wizard phase yeah. of voice assistants, <laughs> that um, you know, we know that they have all the answers, we just don't know the spells or how to ask the questions. And so you know, for us, you know, the, the big learning is like when we were doing stuff with Marriott, then we had to put a, a, a label next to the device to say, these are the kind of questions you ask, and this is how you get into the skill. You know, when we're doing, um, working with Talisker, you know, we're putting stickers on whiskey bottles saying, you know, Alexa, open Talisker tasting. You know, this, this how you get into it, um, and so trying to trying to break that barrier down is what the platforms are doing. They are kind of bringing out name-free skill invocations, so you don't have to remember how to get into um, certain elements of functionality. You just ask the way that you would ask any any other um, human being. Um, that how you'd get these tasks done or get access to that information. So it's, if the, the, the promise of this um, name-free skill invocation comes to light in the way that we think, it is, that they think it's going to, then the challenge is working out how you can build skills in the right way so that your skill is in front of the right person at the right time and you're then in control of that, um, that experience. And that's, mm -hmm. that's very much where a lot of our focus is right now. Just building on that, sorry. I think, um, I think that's such an important point. Discovery comes up all the time, doesn't it, in terms of, you know, there's hundreds, literally 100,000 skills on the App Store, and so many of them just get built, four people use them, and they just go to the graveyard of skills, which as product development people makes us fat, sad. But, um, but I think that point around, you know, the, the behavior is changing, that 
There's a really important role there, though, for don't just build the skill and then hope that people come to it. You know, if you've got very kind of like standard phrases or, you know, in the way that Diageo is doing, owning things like the bar, which don't feel branded, then that's a great use case. But normally, you know, brands are looking at building something and you have to, they're encouraging users to kind of say, open this, open my brand name, open something specific, mm-hmm. um, which is fine. I think the behavior is changing, but trying to, um, we're seeing at the moment that a lot of the sort of voice budgets have moved from innovation teams to brand teams. I think that's where there's going to be a really interesting space is brands beginning to see voice not as this sort of siloed channel, but as a really important part of the marketing mix and the content mix and the customer experience mix and trying to make sure, okay, well, we have a chatbot on this channel. We have voice here. We have all this brilliant content. Um, Ben made the really good point in his workshop this morning around designing voice, designing content voice first from the start, even if you haven't even got a voice experience. And I think that sort of mindset is shifting and that will massively change, I think, how well brands particularly invest in it and leverage it for their for their challenges. That, that's really a huge part as well. And yeah. that's something that, I mean, so yes, we do a, a huge amount, like the strategic upfront and the consultancy side, we do the build, mm-hmm. but also yeah. one of our specialisms is actually the marketing element that comes afterwards. Uh, that speaks to both our individual heritages as, as co-founders, as working in advertising, so, you know, mutually for over a decade, but is that it needs to be seen within that sense. It needs to be seen holistically. It needs to be considered, you know, um, having the invocation on um, an email, on a point of sale, on, you know, direct mail. I won't even go, you know, you know, maybe flyers are going to come back. Well, Who we're, knows? We're testing programmatic audio as well, actually, because you, 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 exactly. you can very specifically target groups. No. Yeah, the huge amount that I, yeah, exactly. And looking at ways in which you can not only tap into the right audience at the right time, but also taking all the learnings that we've had from social and from wider marketing to use that for your skill. If you build it, that people probably won't come. Mm. And I think those budgets are just starting to be unlocked where brands are starting to understand that, mm. which I think caused a lot of disillusionment in the early days. We are very, 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 very close to the end. <laughs> very, very quickly, one at a time, one key takeaway for people to take away with them that will help them design better voice experiences. We'll start with you, Ben. Um, well, I'll just repeat actually something you, you mentioned already. So, the way we're thinking about voice at Babylon is designing voice first, just to build on what that actually means. Um, what we're finding is that it's if you t- looked at your FAQs today and you read that content out loud, you'd find it probably wasn't suitable. So, what if you started authoring your content, even if it's not for voice today? as though you're thinking about voice. It has to have that brevity, that shortness, that snappiness that you want from a voice experience. Because that content scales. The content that you have at the moment designed for a screen doesn't. So I'm training doctors and content people to actually sit at home and read stuff out loud to make sure it sounds right in voice. Again, even if it's not necessarily targeted voice right away. So work with your content strategists, work with your folks internally to figure out how you can start seeing scalability in your content in the future. Cool. And, um, and for, for us, like, we, you know, we're all massively trying to push um, voice forward. So for us, it's looking to see where it makes most sense to use voice to delegate a task. And uh, where that task, if delegated via voice, is going to save the user the most amount of time. And that's where we're spending all of our time. Because if we get those bits right, then A, we'll push people over to voice, and B, there's a huge, uh, huge amount of value that we can capture. Jen? Um. <clears throat> Uh, from a UX specific point of view, just speaking to the room, um, we've been spending a lot of time this year creating a very, very robust um, testing um, scenario, basically the testing loop that we have that we use for internal t- signal testing, and then how that can come out as beta um, releases and so on and so forth, so we can actually get first party data ahead of actually having an MVP release. So actually really working into that methodology has been something incredibly important that hasn't really been, I'd say, done as much as it should have within VUX, within UX, yes, there's a lot of learnings. Uh, My general point on voice would be um, that smart speakers are red herring, Uh, voices everywhere, 2020 is going to be the battle of the um, ear pods, so location is never going to be more important. And very quickly, Quirin. Yeah, I'll be quick. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think what I would really 
want you all to, to, to realize and really remember that there's also really an ethical part about this. You're, you're really in people's worlds and conversations are sometimes very personal. And what we do with, with the data behind these conversations, uh, that needs to be handled uh, in a right way. And also the answers you as a voice agent give back. Um, I wouldn't want you to over include uh, only marketing people wanting to put all their <laughs> ideas mm -hmm. in that content and because you as a designer have the power to bring that to light and really well get that discussion going on is this really what we want to answer with or deal with yeah okay. and very finally in the words of Jerry Springer one final thought <laughs> for Rosie one key takeaway um, I'm completely on board with Jen I think the analytics and the optimization is absolutely key we are in v1 so not just kind of pushing something out and seeing how it's going but kind of taking a really iterative approach and getting brands particularly to think really long term about this so build a skill but iterate make it evergreen you know try and just learn as we go and I think you know that's going to be the way that we we create the best experiences <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. <Yeah. laughs> Sounds like a chant. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, please, a round of applause for our panel. <laughs> and one final thought for me is to listen to the VUX World podcast, if you, uh, if you like.